Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 151, Temptation. Termaburo's thunderous voice resonated in Lumian's mind. Yes, a snort of laughter broke free from Lumian. His words oozed sarcasm as he retorted. So, Auror and the entire village were snuffed out just so you could set foot on this soil. Why the hell should I help you shatter your shackles? If you morphed into an angel with a boon, I could have swiped your abilities over and over with the ritual I just performed, under the watchful eyes of the mighty existence. Until, of course, I too bask in the angelic status of the inevitability pathway. Then, I could breathe life back into Aurora and restore everyone to the pre cordu destruction era. How pathetic would you look then? If you hold the right Bayonder characteristic, I can bide my time until I ascend as an angel of the hunter pathway, seizing power on par with your inevitability skills. Once my army is vast enough, I'll free you, crush you, subjugate you, and make you resurrect Auror. Hell, I might be able to pull it off myself. I'll subject you to an eternity of torment till the end of time. I never had the hots for the inevitability pathway's boon. But now that I know the ritual was meant for your descent, I'm salivating at the thought of siphoning off all your might and pride. The more Lumian rambled, the higher his adrenaline spiked. His provoker potion seemed to digest a notch. Termaburo's voice was eerily steady, unfazed by Lumian's rant. I've encountered my fair share of Beyonders in the cosmos, and I've seen legions of races graced by the Lord's touch. Most of them can't cross the threshold into divinity because that one extra step would obliterate their physical and mental existence. The quest for godhood is rife with peril. Are you so sure you can truly evolve into an angel? You should be aware that we're not talking about slim odds here. Saying it's a one in a million or one in ten million chance doesn't even begin to capture the enormous task of ascending to the angel level. If you perish on the Bayonder path, Aurora Lee will follow suit. The seal binding you will naturally dissolve, freeing me from my predicament. Lumian threw his head back and laughed. His laughter bounced off the quarry's cavernous walls, heightening the eerie quiet and heaviness underground. So, why aren't you sitting tight, waiting for me to kick the bucket? Lumian picked up the carbide lamp and strode out of the quarry cave. A cryptic smile played on his lips. I don't give a damn what you're plotting or what your endgame is. I couldn't care less whether you're a saint or a sinner. All I know is that Aurora and everyone in Kordu village are dead because of you. He paused for a beat, his face contorted into a maniacal grin. Someone's gotta pay the piper for this. Guillaume Bennett, you, and even your so-called lord. Termiburos fell silent. The booming voice that had filled Lumian's mind, heart, bloodstream, bone marrow, and cavities disappeared entirely. Phew, Lumian heaved a sigh, clutching the carbide lamp as he navigated the pitch black underground. Despite the conversation's brevity, it had drained him. In Lumian's previous worldview, corruption was merely that, corruption. At its extreme, it was comparable to power granted by an evil god. The concept of an angel being shackled within him was beyond his wildest dreams. Amidst the wreckage of Kordu village, atop the crimson-hued mountain, stood the body of a three-headed, six-armed behemoth, a vessel designed for an incoming angel. It was a mystery how much it deviated from a bona fide angel, but it already filled Lumian with a sense of invincibility. Had he not remembered their vile deeds, he might have been swayed to give it a shot. From where he stood, pledging allegiance to the eternal blazing sun and the god of steam and machinery seemed no different than submitting to the hidden existence known as inevitability. At worst, he'd lose himself. Regaining his composure, Lumian's senses suddenly tingled. He darted into a side alcove, using loose gravel to snuff out the carbide lamp. Moments later, the hurried footfalls of three people echoed from the adjacent tunnel, soon swallowed by the Inkai darkness. Underground Trier is a hive of activity too. Lumian bided his time for a couple of minutes before digging out the carbide lamp and rejoining the upward path. The interruption allowed him to collect his thoughts and consider a conundrum. Given that the corruption inside him was a living entity, the angel of the inevitability domain, Termaburos, why had his plea for a boon been successful? Termaburos wasn't just raw power lacking consciousness, responding automatically to the correct ritual. He could deny granting the boon. Could it be that his imprisonment is so severe that he can't even choose to resist the ritual? The thought made Lumian realize why Termaburos was so desperate to flee. According to Madame Magician, with every boon he granted, Termaburos would weaken marginally and the corresponding corruption would dwindle. Simultaneously, the seal imposed by the great existence wouldn't slacken. As Termaburos's power faded, he would be shackled to the brink of extinction. Eventually, even his consciousness might be expunged. 
Lumion steadied himself and began to replay Termaborose's utterances. Great old ones, above the sequences, he'd said great old ones and above the sequences. Lumion's head pounded, as if something was attempting to burrow out of his skull, the instant he dredged up these topics. He stopped his recollection abruptly and murmured to himself, a residual sense of dread lingering. Merely possessing certain knowledge can inflict serious harm. Had I not been safeguarded by the seal of the great existence, would I be dead or afflicted with abnormalities? I was contemplating exploiting Termaborose's desperation to escape, to bleed him dry by compelling him to respond to the ritual magic, thereby boosting the likelihood of success and the eventual impact. But it seems the angel has plenty of tricks up his sleeve to screw me over, even in his imprisoned state. I need to tread carefully. Before I really tap into Termaborose, I must have Madame Magician verify my plan for any flaws. On this front, Lumion doubted that the vice president of the curly-haired baboons research society, Hella, would offer any viable advice. Only Madame Magician, who could effortlessly slip in and out of the time loop and easily tackle the colossus atop the crimson mountain, was worthy of his trust. Lost in a whirlwind of thoughts, Lumion, lamp in hand, navigated his way back to the level marked by a street name, leveraging his honed hunter's intuition and recollection. He attempted to shout in a hushed tone, Termaboros. No answer came. Lumion intended to inquire whether the angel, imprisoned within him, was aware of the events in Cordu. After a thoughtful examination, he concluded that Termaboros likely remained in the dark. Termabros had only materialized in Cordu at the ritual's culmination before being shackled. He was oblivious to the intricate details. Phew, Lumion let out a sigh, surveying his present condition. His provoker potion had undergone further digestion. It was akin to encapsulating a fresh principle of action. Could inciting a superior entity expedite the digestion of the provoker potion? Ah oh yes, this is a high-ranking entity within the inevitability domain. In a way, it's a tip of fate. It aligns somewhat with the principles I've deduced. Lumion mused with a chuckle. Were it not for Termaboros's silence, he would have stirred him up thrice daily, like clockwork meals. Pondering over this, Lumion felt that goading an angel to digest this morsel of a potion wasn't a worthy trade-off. He hypothesized two reasons. First, Termaboros was sealed and presented a relatively low threat. Second, Termaboros hadn't genuinely been incited. Shaking his head, Lumion curbed his thoughts, shelving matters whose solutions eluded him. He retraced his steps to the subterranean Rue Anarchy and climbed the stone steps towards the surface. Having snuffed out the carbide lamp and returned to Auberge Ducock door, Lumion instantly noticed Charlie perched on the steps outside. Charlie puffed on a cigarette, gazing at the grayish-white sky with a somber countenance. What's up? Lumion settled down next to Charlie. Charlie heaved a sigh. Miss Ethan's has moved out. Isn't that a good thing? Lumion queried, his smile unwavering. Charlie stammered, pausing for a few seconds before admitting, yes, it indeed is. Too many folks around here know her and her deeds. Sigh. Lumion clicked his tongue and rose, approaching the whiskey sour vendor and presenting five coppets worth of copper coins. Half a liter of apple whiskey sour. The vendor responded with a grin, got it. He ended up pouring Lumion more than the requested volume of liquor. Lumion's eyebrows quirked, but he refrained from questioning. He ambled back to Charlie, took a seat, and nonchalantly remarked, Seems like the whiskey sour guy recognizes me. Charlie chuckled. He might be aware you're with the Savoy gang. No, the Savoy mob. Lumion sipped his whiskey sour, inquiring, How'd he find out? Charlie cleared his throat. After breaking the news to Miss Ethan's last night, I hit the underground bar for a drink and mentioned your induction into the Savoy mob and your takeover of Aubert's Ducock door. A vivid image flashed in Lumion's mind. Charlie, beer in hand, clambering onto a small round table, flailing his stubby arms. Ladies and gentlemen, lend me your ears. You wouldn't believe the bombshell that dropped at the motel today. Seal, our room 207 resident, is now calling the shots for the Savoy mob and has sent the poison spur mob packing. With a drawn-out sigh, Lumion turned to Charlie and quipped, You're just worried the police won't come knocking at my door, aren't you? Chapter 152, Entrustment Charlie's bones shook as Lumion's words settled in his ears. Yes, so you're saying, you don't want word getting around about you joining the Savoy mob. Charlie had seen the leaders of the Savoy mob, Poison Spur mob, and the rest, their names carried weight in the market district of Rue Anarchy. Yet, as notorious as they were, the law never seemed to touch them. Lumion took a slow pull of his whiskey sour, his grin returning. That's fine. Just think twice before you speak, that's all. Even though Lumion had infiltrated the Savoy mob, he was far from claiming the title of a leader. He hadn't been privy to the mob's deepest secrets, didn't have a crew of thugs at his disposal, 
and all he had to show for it was the rundown dump they called Auberge du Coq d'Or. So Lumian had his sights set on a fast track to infamy, eager to climb the mob's ladder and fulfill Mr. K's mission, a mission that involved gaining the trust and favor of Mr. K, and eventually finding a place in the organization behind him, all to complete the task given by Madame Magician. There is something off about the whole thing, Lumian thought, his left hand stroking his chin. Charlie, standing by his side, asked hesitantly, what exactly should I keep quiet about? He had his hunches, but he didn't want to risk annoying the lawless Lumian by not covering all bases. Lumian's smile didn't falter as he turned to Charlie. Avoid discussing anything tied to Susanna Maddise. That includes any mention of threats I made to her, or that time I posed as a lawyer to get into the police station to talk to you. He had meant to warn Charlie about this, but hadn't found the right moment. Got it. Charlie visibly relaxed. You know, I was thinking about telling the guys at the bar about the time we chased Wilson out of that motel. Charlie's number one hobby was regaling the crowd with his exploits. But Lumian's eyes turned stormy at his words. His gut was telling him Charlie was about to walk into some minor trouble, but it wouldn't be anything life-threatening. In theory, it has nothing to do with Susanna Maddise. If it did, it wouldn't be just trouble, it would be a disaster. I suppose I can stop worrying about Susanna Maddise for a while. But how long is a while? Lumian mulled over the sense of bad luck. He'd come to realize that unless someone was extremely unlucky or lucky, or if danger was about to strike, he needed to concentrate to perceive a person's general luck through his intuition. It was unlike a hunter's danger sense. It wasn't always activated passively. Charlie's voice began to fade as he talked. He turned to Lumian and asked, Why are you staring at me like that? He was half expecting Seal to jump out with a prank. Lumian sneered. You might want to swing by the nearest eternal blazing sun cathedral and say a prayer. I have a feeling you're about to hit a rough patch. His tone mirrored that of Osta Troll, the conman. What kind of rough patch? Charlie asked, his voice sharp. Then it hit him. How would you know? I have a hunch, Lumian replied, a smirk playing on his lips. Of course, it's a joke. Charlie let out a sigh of relief. I'm hoping your prediction's off, then. On the contrary, I couldn't be more certain. Lumian's words were rock solid. Charlie squinted at him, suspicion etched on his face. Lumian let out a low chuckle. And if I'm wrong, I'll give you a thrashing. That way, even if something bad does happen, that just proves me more right. Charlie was speechless. Is that even allowed? Regardless, this approach could come in handy for some practical jokes with some slight modification. Lumian was about to rise when he noticed a thin, mangy mutt creeping towards Auberge du Coq door from the shadowy street, eyeing the trash he'd tossed from the fruit vendor's cart. The mutt moved with care, aware that many of the destitute locals would gladly turn him into dinner. Just then, Lumian lunged forward, pressing the dog's neck to the ground. Caught off guard, the mutt writhed helplessly, burying its teeth in a futile attempt to bite, but its head was immobile. With his free hand, Lumian pulled out a small vial of tulip powder, emptying its contents into his pocket. Then, he held the vial to the mutt's frothing mouth, collecting the saliva as the dog squirmed. Soon, he had five milliliters. He released his grip and stood up. The mutt, ready to snap at him, whimpered and scampered off, tail tucked between its legs, when Lumian shot at a menacing glance. Charlie, who had been standing by, was flabbergasted. A story he'd once heard came rushing back to him. The protagonist in the tale would often describe the villain's cruelty with a line penned by best-selling author Aurora Lee. He would kick any dog that crossed his path. Lumian downed the rest of his whiskey sour and made his way into the motel. As he passed the front desk, the perpetually grumpy Madame Fells forced a smile. Good morning, Seal, Monsieur Seal. Lumian gave the plump Madame Fells a sideways glance and asked nonchalantly, No sign of Monsieur Ive today either. Monsieur Ive, the owner of Auberge du Coq d'Or, was known far and wide in Rue Anarchy for his penny-pinching ways. As the new guardian of Auberge du Coq d'Or, Lumian figured he ought to have a word with Monsieur Ive, just to make sure he didn't run crying to the cops, afraid the Savoy mob would shake him down for more cash. Madame Fells pursed her lips, as stingy as he is, only paying for a weekly cleaning crew. He's a stickler for cleanliness and wouldn't be caught dead in the motel. Who cleans his house? Lumian asked, a hint of amusement in his voice. He's a widower. He and his two kids take care of it. Madame Phil scoffed. If she were the one with that kind of money and a motel to boot, she would hire someone to handle such chores. She'd just sit back and enjoy life. Lumian nodded and chuckled. I noticed he didn't drop by after the cleaning on Monday. Is he still kicking? Madame Fells replied, a hint of fear in her voice, I visit him thrice a week to deliver the motel's earnings and various bills. I'll let him know you want to see him. She mistook Lumian's words as a veiled threat to Monsieur Ive. If he didn't meet with the new guardian of Auberge du Coq d'Or soon, 
His survival might be at stake. Lumion didn't bother to clarify. He climbed the stairs to his room on the second floor. Under his pillow, he found Mr. K's finger and tucked it back into his pocket. After dealing with the tulip powder, he planned to pick up some containers for the ingredients he needed to gather next. But then, a knock on the door interrupted his thoughts. Lumion swung the door open. Curiosity peaked. He didn't recognize the footsteps. In the doorway stood a man in his forties, clad in a dark jacket, worn-out brown trousers, and a grubby cotton hat. He offered a smile, asking, Is this Monsieur Seal? Who else would it be? Madam, Lumion retorted, his eyes taking in the man's appearance, expression, and body language. His brown hair, though slightly greasy, was neatly combed. His dark brown eyes held a hint of sycophancy, and his lips were creased with lines of practiced smiles. He had an affable air, but there was an unmistakable slickness about him. Yes, 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 the man echoed Lumian's words. Lumian's eyebrows twitched. And who might you be? I'm Fitz from room 401. Bankrupt businessman, the man introduced himself with a congenial smile. Without waiting for Lumian to press further, he spilled his beans. I went belly up cause of a con that cost me 100,000 verl door. I've been traveling between Trier and Suet for over a decade, saving up. Wanted to settle down, start a family, but then this swindler tricked me out of everything, promising a joint venture. If you help me recover that money, I'm willing to part with 30%, no, 50%. Lumion didn't invite Fitz into room 207. Leaning against the doorframe, arms folded, he asked, Why didn't you go after that money with Margaret or Wilson before? It wasn't as if they required an upfront payment. Fitz didn't beat around the bush. I did go to Margaret. He agreed initially, but then one day, he just said it wasn't possible to recover the money. Even the poison spur mob couldn't retrieve it. Was the con man bankrupt or backed by someone who made the poison spur mob tread lightly? Lumion, who had been only half interested till now, leaned in. Did Margaret say why? Fitz shook his head. No, but it's certainly not because Timmons is broke. His dance hall and courtier de l'Observatoire is printing money. Timmons, Lumion suspected the con man had either powerful backing or was shielded by a high-ranking figure, which made the poison spur mob wary of pressing him for repayment. Or maybe, Timmons was a force unto himself. So why do you think I can get your money back? Lumion asked Fitz, a smirk playing on his lips. Fitz pondered for a moment before laying it all out. You're more ruthless than Margaret. Plus, even if you decide not to pursue after your investigation, I have nothing to lose. Without that money, I can't afford to pay a dime. Honest to a fault, Lumion nodded, appreciating the candor. I'll look into it, but don't get your hopes up. If Timmons was simply bluffing and managed to scare off the poison spur mob, the prospect of pocketing an easy 50,000 verl door was tempting to anyone. Fitz, the bankrupt businessman, was playing a long shot. With a nod of assurance from Lumion, he thanked him and made his exit from the second floor. In that moment, Lumion realized that his spirituality had bounced back considerably. The recovered amount surpassed his original spirituality reserves. The alms monk has boosted my spirituality significantly. At sequence 8, I can rival the spirituality of other pathways. Lumion mused quietly. Simultaneously, he recalled an uncanny sensation he experienced while sipping the whiskey sour. If he chose to live in poverty, practiced self-restraint, abstained from alcohol, shunned wastefulness, sought alms, and preached, all while adopting the demeanor of an ascetic monk, he would likely experience an enhancement in his intuitive sense of destiny and the likelihood of success of his five ritual spells. Yet, Lumion had no intention of following that path. He believed it would morph him into a mirror image of the bestower, gradually merging his identity with his. Shaking off his introspective thoughts, Lumion left the room, making a beeline for Sal de Balbrise. His next move was to solicit the Savoy mob's help to gather the remaining ingredients and the right containers required for the prophecy spell. He had to seize every opportunity at his disposal. Chapter 153, Strange Rule Standing before the white globe-shaped statue, an assemblage of countless skulls, in the Salle de Balbris, Lumion paused. His eyes scanned the Intis inscription, they sleep here, waiting for the arrival of happiness and hope. Pulling his gaze from the statue, he strode toward the entrance. Two henchmen, donned in crisp white shirts and dark overcoats, spun on their heels to face him. Good morning, Seal. They'd been buzzing with the whispers about this brash newcomer who'd reportedly offed Margaret and left Wilson licking his wounds, all within a few fleeting days. It was no secret that he'd been roped into the Savoy mob. Good morning, my cabbages, Lumion tossed back, his lips curling into a grin as he borrowed Darid's pet phrase. The Sal de Balbrise was still waking up. Waitstaff moved with placid efficiency, arranging chairs, scrubbing the floors. Lumion had intended to seek out Louis, 
a familiar face. No need to ruffle the feathers of Baron Brignais over such small matters. But there, nestled at the bar, sat Maxime, the very same one who'd tailed him. Maxime, still sporting his trademark cap, drank a pint of rye beer. A smirk spread across Lumian's face as he sauntered over. Perceiving a presence nearing him, Maxime, out of habit, flicked a sidelong glance. He went rigid, as though struck by a sudden frost. In the next heartbeat, he vaulted off his stool and swiveled toward Lumian, plastering on a toadying grin. Good morning, Seal. He too had caught wind of the rumors, of Seal's assassination of Margaret and the defenestration of Wilson from the fourth floor of Aubridge Ducock door. A surge of relief washed over him. Thank the stars he hadn't pushed his luck when he'd been nab-tailing Seal. Considering Seal's penchant for violence, he could have easily ended up as fodder for the rats in some godforsaken corner of underground trier. This man was a bona fide killing machine. No qualms, no hesitation. Lumian smiled. Nearly Seal doesn't quite ring with the proper respect, does it? Seeing Maxime Blanche, Lumian added, I'm curious as to when I'll hear Baron Seal rolling off your tongue. This was a jest, yes, but also a thinly veiled indication of his ambition to rise to the ranks of the Savoy mob leadership and sooner rather than later. Soon, very soon, Maxime replied with a forced smile. His internal dialogue sang a different tune. I'd call you Baron this very moment if it kept you happy, just like our Baron isn't a real Baron, but a self-proclaimed one. Lumian claimed a stool at the bar and patted the one next to him. Have a seat. I have a few questions for you. Maxime swiftly obliged, gesturing to the rye beer before him. Fancy a pint. Ranger for me, if you please. Lumian responded without missing a beat. A ranger, a tangy blend of orange and pomegranate beer, cost two licks more than the rye. Though it pinched his pocket, Maxime hollered over to the bartender, a glass of ranger. Swiveling back towards Lumian, he flashed a grin. What would you like to know? Lumian bided his time until the generous pint of the orange-colored beer was delivered before launching his inquiry. How did you join our Savoy mob? I'm Savoy born and bred. Maxime gestured to his weather-beaten features, hopped over to Trier in search of greener pastures, but my buddy who'd put me up had already joined the Savoy mob. The Savoy mob was the brainchild of a handful of Savoy natives who'd made their living as laborers, servants, and peddlers in La March du Quartier du Gentleman. They were a fierce lot, unafraid to put themselves in harm's way, and they'd quickly carved out their own slice of the pie. As the mob's influence grew, they began to pull in recruits from other provinces and even trier locals, but the heart of the organization still came from Savoy. Lumian gave a slight nod, steering the conversation to his next question. And is Baron Brignais the head honcho of the whole Savoy mob? No. Maxime stared at Lumian, aghast. He'd joined the mob without even grasping the basics, and he'd taken out Margaret and severely injured Wilson in the name of the Savoy mob. Lumian took a leisurely sip of his orange pomegranate beer, a playful grin adorning his face. I was under the impression that Baron Brignais was the head honcho. I mean, his swagger, his flair, his brawn. How could he not be the top dog? Maxime recoiled in terror, clapping a hand over Lumian's mouth. Were such words safe to spill in such an open area? If word got back to that person, it could put a serious kink in his relationship with the Baron. Maxime wasted no time in setting the record straight. The Baron is in charge of the Salle de Balbrise, Avenue du March, and the Lone Shark operations. His peers include Rat Cristo who oversees smuggling, Giant Simon who runs the dance joints on Rue du Rossignol, Red Boots Franca who oversees Rue des Blouses Blanches, and Bloody Palm Black who controls half of La Marche du Courtier du Gentleman. There's a top dog above them, but I've never laid eyes on him nor do I know who he is. In a hushed voice, Maxime added, Rumor has it he's a legitimate merchant, a card-carrying member of the Savoy Chamber of Commerce. And he's no small fry, either, a member of the Savoy Chamber of Commerce. So, the Chamber of Commerce is backing a mob to handle their dirty laundry and keep the competition in check. Lumian pieced together the puzzle from his own experiences as a drifter, snippets from Aurora's offhand comments and a smattering of books, magazines, and newspapers he'd devoured at home. News of Seal's arrival at the Salle de Balbrise reached Louis, Baron Brignais' shadow. He made a beeline for the bar, his heart pounding with worry that the audacious country boy was about to stir the pot yet again. He was really worried that the bold country boy would cause trouble again. Finding Lumian engrossed in conversation with Maxime, Louis slid onto a stool on the other side, easing into the chat. What's got you coming to the Salle de Bal Bries at this hour? Lumian shot him a sly smile. I've got a favor to ask. Louis, his forehead still sporting a nasty bruise, shrank back at the sight of Lumian's grin. 
What is it? Sensing they were about to dive into heavier matters, Maxim beat a hasty retreat from the bar, nursing his rye beer closer to the dance floor. Lumion retracted his gaze and said slowly, I need you to fetch me a lizard's eye, a rock from an eagle's nest, and a snake's venom gland. He kept the full list of the prophecy spell's ingredients under wraps, planning to source them from different places. What do you need those for? Louis found the trio of items vile and bizarre. Lumion chuckled. Remember how Margot bit the dust. Louis felt a chill run down his spine. It felt like a veiled threat, and it was working. And not trying to rattle you. Lumion snickered to himself. I stabbed him. My blade was laced with poison. Right? Louis remembered Seal's chat with Baron Brignise. Seeing Louis still hadn't caught on, Lumion mentally berated, Why is this guy denser than Charlie? He sighed, spelling it out for him. Those items are to whip up another batch of poison. What are you planning? Louis nearly jumped out of his skin. He had a hunch Lumion was about to stir the pot. Self-defense, Lumion replied tersely. With no grounds to object, Louis let out a sigh of relief, promising, I'll get someone on the job to collect those three items for you. He ran through the list of items again, making sure he'd got it straight. Once he'd confirmed the details, Lumion took a swig of his ranger, switching gears. Ever heard of the Sal de Bal unique? Louis eyed Lumion suspiciously, advising, best steer clear of that place. The dance hall's owner, Timmons, is tight with the police commissioner of Quartier de l'Observatoire, and there's a shadowy organization pulling his strings. Anyone who's tried to squeeze them has found themselves in a world of hurt, and some have even vanished off the face of the world. Each courtier and trier had its own police headquarters, each headed by a commissioner. The police commissioner's official title was the Commissioner of the Trier Police Affairs Committee, answering to the Minister of the Trier Police Department. So that's why the poison spur mob never had the guts to chase up Timmins' debt. Lumian nodded, deep in thought, seeing the worry etched on Louis's face, afraid he was about to stir up a hornet's nest. Lumian threw him a curveball. Who else in the poison spur mob ranks up there with Margot? And who's their boss? What are you trying to do? Louis almost blurted out. Could it be that Seal's planning to knock off all the heavy hitters in the poison spur mob? Are you out of your mind? Keeping his cool, Louis replied, That's none of your concern right now. Lumian responded with a knowing smile, not pushing the matter. He downed his ranger. In the shadowy enclave of Courtier de l'Observatoire, nestled near the catacombs, Lumian found Ostatrol huddled by the bonfire. He laughed mockingly, you're the most professional person I've ever come across. Like clockwork, Asta was here seven days a week, peddling his con. I'd love to be soaking myself on some beach, but my debts tell a different story. The thought of hopping a steam locomotive out of Trier and dodging his outstanding loans had crossed Asta's mind. Yet, each time he made it as far as the station, Baron Brignise's goons would be there to give him a good thrashing. This had instilled in him a healthy fear of the Baron's reach, and he'd since abandoned any such ideas. I need you to fetch me a few things, Lumion cut to the chase, settling down beside Asta. For each item you bring, there's an extra five world ore in it for you. Asta's eyes sparked with interest. What are you after? Lumion stared into the fire, his voice low. Lynx innards, hyena tongue, stag bone marrow, and any deadly herb. They're not easy to come by. Asta tried to haggle. He'd already made up his mind to scour the eateries in Quartier de l'Observatoire. Lumion brushed him off, changing the subject. Where can I find aquatic monsters in Trier? Asta pondered a moment before replying. There's an underground river in the catacombs nearby, fed by the Esrenzo River. Every so often, someone claims to have run into an aquatic monster, and occasionally, some surface along the Esrenzo River banks, but they're quickly dispatched by the purifiers or the machinery hive mind. Lumian nodded. Do you know the Sal de Bal unique? Sure do. Asta pointed skyward. It's over on Rue Ancient, right by Place du Purgatoire. One verl door. Show me the way. Lumian rose to his feet. He planned to scope out the place, gather what intel he could. If it was a dead end, he'd move on. In no time, Asta was leading Lumian topside, veering into Rue Ancient near the square and halting in front of a vintage edifice. The building, a somber shade of blue-gray, retained its pre-Roselle charm classic pediments, a chevron roof, and leaded windows. The Salle de Bal unique occupied the ground floor, its entrance resembling a giant maw. It happened to be past noon, and a carriage pulled up to the curb as three men and a woman alighted. Dressed in dark short suits, they sauntered towards the Salle de Bal unique. As they neared the entrance, each member of the quartet produced a monocle, fitting it over their right eye. Watching this, Lumian turned to Asta, bemusement written all over his face. Asta, flashing a knowing smile, enlightened him, that's one of Sal de Bal Unique's rules. Everyone who steps inside must be donning a short suit and a monocle. Chapter 154, Mini Theater Taking in Asta's revelation, 
Lumian couldn't help but chuckle, thinking, what kind of strange rule is this? His mind flicked back to the turtle walking, the space bridge, clutching a candle while touring the catacombs, and sprinting just to keep up with the latest fad. He felt that this seemed inconsequential, but perhaps not for the folks of Trier, who seemed to relish something unique. As the stream of monocle-clad patrons flowed in, Lumian queried with a casual air, what happens if a newcomer isn't privy to the rule? Asta gestured to the far end of Ruanchen. There's a place selling monocles and short suits there. I'd wager the proprietor of Sal de Bal Unique is behind it. No doubt about it. Lumian murmured under his breath. He wouldn't put it past Timmons to concoct such a rule for the Sal de Bal Unique to cash in on the monocle and short suit trade. Undeniably, it was also a nod to the citizens of Trier's relentless pursuit of the latest trends in fashion. How long has this joint been in business? Lumian nonchalantly gestured toward the Sal de Bal Unique across the street. Over two decades. It's been here since I first landed in Trier. Rumor has it, it opened when dance halls became the rage. Asta stole a glance toward Place du Purgatoire. Anything else? I need to get back underground. His mind was on making money, wary of missing out on potential clients seeking his divination and assistance. Lumian swung his gaze onto him. Asta's heart stuttered, feeling as though he were in the crosshairs of a formidable predator. What's the matter? He subconsciously forced a smile again. Lumian withdrew his gaze, nonchalantly advising, stay sharp for the next couple of days. What? Asta found himself flustered, bewildered, and somewhat frightened. Seal isn't threatening me, is he? We just had a smooth collaboration. He even tasked me with finding some materials. A grin played at the corners of Lumian's mouth. Exactly as I said, but it's got nothing to do with me. Also, do me a favor and dig up more details on the aquatic monster. The more comprehensive, the better. Same pay as before. Is he implying that I might be getting unlucky and be beaten up? Asta tried to decipher Lumian's cryptic message. At the same time, he found something oddly familiar about Lumian's demeanor and tone but couldn't quite put his finger on it. Retracing his steps toward Place du Purgatoire, Asta resolved to cast a divination for himself to see if ill fortune truly loomed ahead. As a secret suppliant, his divination prowess was remarkably superior to the average person. Suddenly, it struck him why he found the whole exchange eerily familiar. Wasn't this the exact manner he addressed his own customers? Across from the antiquated building, Lumian contemplated whether to invest in a short suit and monocle to infiltrate the Sal de Bal Unique and gather intel. If Timmons is indeed part of some mysterious organization and chummy with the police commissioner, snatching him for a bounty of Verldor isn't a smart move. It'd muck up my operation. Wouldn't the money spent on the short suits and monocles go down the drain? They don't come cheap, after all. Lumian was never one to hold back on expenses, with Trier teeming with generous souls, but he knew when to pinch pennies. Mulling over his options, he scanned his surroundings, his eyes landing on an alone bar diagonally across the Salle de Bal Unique. Patrons of a dance hall would likely frequent a bar too. They must be rivals. Suddenly, a light bulb went off in Lumian's head. After all, enemies often knew one another best, and those most familiar with the dance hall would likely be its competitors. Even if their accounts were likely embellished, they could still offer some grains of truth. Without missing a beat, Lumian swiveled around and sauntered into the alone bar. The buildings on Rue Ancient were steeped in antiquity, with most dating back to pre-Roselle times. Their windows were mere slits, letting in scant daylight. The overarching theme here was one of darkness. Unperturbed by the unlit gas lamps, Lumian navigated through the dimly lit hall, sparsely populated by patrons, and took a stool at the bar. Removing his cap, he ordered a gin on the rocks. The bar counter was tucked away in the darkest corner of the joint. The lean bartender was shrouded in shadows, his features obscured, revealing only a silhouette. Despite Lumian's keen eyesight, he could barely discern the man's curly black hair, slightly blue eyes, and a somewhat low bridge of his nose. As he awaited his gin, Lumian flashed a casual smile and remarked, Business seems slow here. The Sal de Bal unique across the way appears to be drawing quite the crowd. The bartender slid a lemon wedge and iced gin across to Lumian. Casting a glance at the door, he replied, We do all right, but most folks are downstairs waiting for the play. How about it? Fancy a peek. Patrons with drinks can gain entry to the cellar for five licks. I'll make it eight for your gin. A play, Lumian couldn't hide his astonishment. This was a facet none of the Rue Anarchy bars could boast. The bartender sighed, explaining, They can dance, sing, shoot pool, play cards across the road. We've got to stand out somehow to lure in customers. Many bars and cafes on the North Shore now have their own mini-theaters. Lumian was at a loss for words, resorting to a mere sigh. 
has the bar scene gotten so cutthroat? He then produced three 20 copit silver coins etched with gears and a five copit copper coin, handing them to the bartender. The total amounted to 13 licks or 65 copits, including the ticket to the mini theater for the performance. The bartender promptly pointed to the stairs next to the counter leading down. You can head to the cellar anytime. Feel free to take your drink with you. No ticket required. Lumian wasn't in a rush to vacate the counter. He smiled, asking, The salle de bal unique across the way seems rather unique. It certainly is. The bartender lowered his voice. Did you get swindled over there? Is that why you're so curious? Exactly. Lumian nodded without missing a beat. He saw no reason of hiding it. The bartender chortled. We get scammed hopefuls straggling in here every day, but none ever pull it off. Heck, I once spotted the police commissioner of Quartier de l'Observatoire, Condi, strutting into the dance hall, all decked out in a short suit and a monocle. Timmons is no pushover. Lumian quickly abandoned any notion of conning the proprietor of Sal de Bal Unique. Gin in hand, he pushed away from the counter, making his way down to the cellar. Before he could reach the timber door, the bartender's shout echoed, patron coming through. The door creaked open with a groan. Lumian slowed his stride, taking in his surroundings as he stepped inside. It was a makeshift theater, a half-height wooden platform stretching across the far end. Two gas wall lamps cast a feeble light. Where the illumination fell short, stools and chairs were scattered sparsely. At that moment, over twenty guests were settled in, engrossed in the show unfolding on the stage. The silence was deafening. Punctuated only by the sporadic clink of glasses, the dimly lit cellar rendered almost eerily hushed. Lumian claimed a chair near the exit, his eyes drifting to the stage. The performer was not a person but a puppet half the height of a person. Adorned in a palette of yellow, white, and red paint, regardless of gender, each puppet bore an overstated grin. Guided by nearly invisible threads, the puppets moved, opening their mouths, turning, running, carrying out a variety of plays. From somewhere, a deep male voice and a slightly shrill female voice took turns delivering the lines. Bathed in the faint, yellowish glow from the gas lamps, against the looming darkness, the painted clown puppets took on a sinister edge. Lumian was instinctively put off by the ambience. Not one to squander the ticket cost, he stuck around a bit longer until the play wrapped up. Throughout, not a sound was made. The audience, some faces bathed in the yellow light, others shrouded in darkness, were far more engrossed than Lumian had imagined. Having drained his gin, Lumian took his leave of the mini-theater, where only two gas lamps held off the darkness. As Lumian made his way back to La Marche du Courtier du Gentleman, he claimed a window seat in a public carriage. As the shops and pedestrians retreated in the backdrop, he mulled over his next moves. First order of business, secure some aquatic monster flesh and collect the necessary components for the prophecy spell. Second, elevate my standing in the Savoy mob, aiming for a leadership position sooner rather than later. What's the plan? Lost in his thoughts, his eyes snagged on a familiar figure. There was Wilson of the Poison Spur mob, clad in a white shirt and black jacket, his craggy face framed by a mop of curly brown hair. With his two goons in tow, Wilson navigated Avenue du March, disappearing down a side alley. He moved with an assured stride, his posture unscathed. Lumian was taken aback. He's up and about after being thrown down by him. The fall was from four stories high. That was some recovery. Made cockroaches look like amateurs. A theory started to form in Lumian's mind. The poison spur mob has extraordinary healing powers. Possibly planter pathways doctor. As he pondered, a memory surfaced. In his dream, Madame Pualis had demonstrated the power to heal wounds instantaneously. Although the dream might have distorted or exaggerated the reality, Madame Puolis's anomalous pathway did encompass a sphere related to life, and Louis Lund was suspected to show up on Avenue du March. Could the force behind the poison sperm mob be linked to the evil god worshipped by Madame Puolis? As Lumian ruminated over this, a smirk slowly crept onto his face. Chapter 155, Jenna the circumstances of Wilson's rapid recovery were riddled with uncertainty. Lumian toyed with the idea that it was the work of a Sequence 8 doctor from the planter pathway, or a Sequence 9 apothecary from its namesake pathway. Yet, his heart clung to the hope of unmasking Madame Puolis and her subordinates. Had he pieced together the puzzle sooner, and had Wilson and his crew not gone far off into the distance, Lumian would have thrown himself from the moving public carriage, hot on their trail. He envisioned wrangling Wilson into some clandestine quarry cave, pressing him for answers about his miraculous recuperation. If this saga bore no link to the evil god that Madame Puolis revered, Lumian was prepared to swallow his pride and apologize to Wilson, who, in turn, would owe Lumian his life for not permanently silencing him. 
but to snuff him out was also on the table. The ball was in Lumian's court. As the carriage came to a halt at its station, Lumian was the first to alight, retracing his steps to the alley where Wilson and his crew had disappeared. No barricades existed here. It was a bustling place, with people constantly coming and going. Wilson and his gang hadn't left any clear trail. Lumian devoted a painstaking quarter of an hour to trying to discern any signs of them, finally admitting defeat. But he wasn't beaten down. Wilson may have slipped through his fingers, but there were others like Will or Williamson. The Poison Spur mob was a hydra of sorts, with a plethora of leaders just a notch above Wilson. Each had their own turf, their own dealings. They could run, but they couldn't hide. Lumian just needed patience. Sooner or later, he'd cross paths with one or two of them. And they, undoubtedly, were more intimately involved with the shadowy forces pulling the strings behind the Poison Spur mob than Wilson. They knew more. Phew. Exhaling a deep breath, Lumian wrestled his impatience into submission, deciding to lay low and watch for a while before concocting a hunting strategy. If the Poison Spur mob truly was entwined with the evil god that Madame Puales worshipped, then the leaders on par with Margit were either sequence 8 seconds, endowed with Bayonder characteristics, or they were spawn of an evil god, gifted with boons akin to a sequence 8 Bayonder. They could even be stronger. If Lumian didn't arm himself with enough intel and set an appropriate snare, he was likely to end up on the losing side. I can't forget I'm a hunter just because I've become a provoker. Chiding himself, Lumian slipped down Avenue du March and strolled into the Salle de Bal Brice. Given it was barely past three in the afternoon, the place was practically deserted. No music played, no one danced. His eyes immediately found Louis, the thug, nursing a glass of pomegranate ale at the bar counter. Soda. Lumian grinned, sauntering over. How about drinking something an adult would drink? Louis swiveled, meeting Seal's amiable smile draped over the bar counter. The sight left him momentarily stunned, as if he couldn't quite place the young man before him. Was this the same seal who masked his wild ruthlessness behind a constant grin, one who'd resort to violence over the slightest disagreement? He seemed more like a greenhorn, a naive country boy who had just been roped into the Savoy mob. Louis gave his soda a wistful swirl, a bitter smile tugging at his lips. I've got to be at the Baron's side later. Can't afford to get sloshed. Lumian's eyes flicked to the bruised knot on Louis' forehead, a chuckle bubbling up. He pointed at his forehead, commenting, still nursing that bump. How long's it been? I ran into Wilson earlier. After I broke his arm and tossed him from the fourth floor, you'd think he'd be worse for wear. But he looked perfectly fine. Louis was taken aback. You're saying Wilson's back on his feet. Seems so, at least on the surface. Wanted to say hello, but he hightailed it out of there too fast. Lumian's tone carried a hint of regret. Say hello. More like you want to rough up Wilson again and not even give the guy a chance to heal, Louis thought. But he didn't dare voice it. His face took on a grave cast as he muttered to himself, when we clashed with the poison spur mob in the past. Their wounded always bounce back in just a few days. The Baron thinks they've got some Bayonders with a knack for healing. But for someone like Wilson to recover so rapidly from such serious injuries, that's unheard of. Could it be because you guys have never managed to put a serious dent in any of the poison spur mob members? Lumian's voice was laced with mockery. Louis pondered, then conceded, there have been a few, but not many. Plus, we usually don't see them again for a good long while. By then, they're all healed up. So, Wilson's recovery outpaces even Doctor and Apothecary Bayonder powers. Lumian managed to glean a crucial tidbit from Louis's words. Although it could point to a higher sequence Bayonder on the corresponding pathway, it at least narrowed down some possibilities for him. Just as Lumian was gearing up to probe the progress on gathering concoction ingredients, a stunning figure swept into the room. A woman, ostentatiously attired, with her chestnut hair tied up, loose tendrils framing her ears, cheeks, and falling down her back. Her face was dusted with powder, black eyeliner accentuating her blue eyes, lending them a deep, decadent allure. At present, she was decked out in a bold red dress that left little to the imagination, sequins catching the light at strategic spots. Isn't this the chantus known for her body songs at the poison spur mob Sal de Grismel? Lumian did a double take. This was the Savoy mob's Sal de Bal Brise. Still, Lumian couldn't be entirely sure if it was the same woman. The singer had a mole by her lips, while this woman sported one at the corner of her left eye. Catching your eye, is she? That little minx. Louis followed Lumian's gaze. Lumian chuckled. How about we use a more respectful moniker? Manners matter. You sound just like the Baron sometimes, Louis mused. 
Her stage name is Little Minx, Little Minx Jenna. She's known as a showy diva. And what exactly is a showy diva? Lumion didn't attempt to cover up his ignorance. After all, he was a newcomer to Trier, straight out of a backwater like Cordu. Louis took a moment to recall the Baron's words and then delivered smoothly. It's all about her performance style, her acting, her flamboyant outfits. She's a standout singer. She's a chantus too. Lumion probed. She performs at the Salle de Gristmill as well. Sure does. As long as she's getting paid, she'll belt out tunes in any dance hall on Rue Anarchy. As Louis spoke, Little Minx Jenna sauntered over. Her blue eyes roamed the room, lingering on Lumion before moving to Louis. Ten songs, four Verl Door. I'll keep a third of the tips thrown on stage. Deal. Louis had the Baron's approval. Only four Verl Door for a night's performance. Lumion found himself questioning. Had he overpaid Asta Troll? In unfamiliar territory, he was woefully out of touch with the going rates. Spotting his lingering gaze, Jenna swiveled her head, flashing him a grin. Feel free to let your eyes wander a bit lower. She was referencing her scantily clad chest. For Lumion, whose only exposure to such scenarios was through novels, this was uncharted territory. Yet, his face betrayed no unease. Flashing a smile, he said, I was merely wondering. The last time I spotted you, your mole was by your lips. Now it's nestled by your eye. Jenna's reply came in the form of a captivating smile, which made Louis swallow hard. Are you from out of town? Jenna queried. Lumion bobbed his head in affirmation. With a playful grin, Jenna leaned in, a finger tracing her cheek as she softly elucidated. It's all the rage here in Trier. Ladies often sport a faux mole, right in the middle of the cheek for elegance, smack in the middle of the nose for audacity, at the corners of the eyes for passion by the lips for allure, and nestled in the décolletage for secrets. As she spoke, she sent Lumion a saucy wink, as if to say, Today, I'm all about passion. Ah, uh, Trier. Lumion could only shake his head in amazement. Given their proximity, the intoxicating blend of Jenna's natural scent, and the heady perfume she wore invaded his senses. This led Lumion to instinctively rub his nose. Jenna's reaction was immediate. Don't tell me you still have your virginity. I'm not a street girl, but for you, I might make an exception. She took a moment to appraise Lumion, seemingly pleased with what she saw. Virginity, something that magically returns every morning at 6 a.m. Lumion scoffed inwardly, his smile nonchalant. Right now, I'm afraid you might miss your performance tonight. Back at the All Tavern in Cordu Village, Lumion often had to match the locals in their coarseness, else he'd become the butt of their jokes. Jenna's response was a hearty laugh and a dismissive wave of her hand. I'll find you after my set tonight. With that, she sauntered off towards the modest wooden stage at the front of the dance floor, keen to get a feel for the place. Isn't she jumping the gun a bit? Or is the agreement on a time and place? Lumion mused to himself. She was clearly just yanking his chain. Louis chimed in, a tinge of envy coloring his voice, don't fall for her act. She gets a kick out of toying with good-looking men. She won't actually follow through. I reckon she's Franca's sweetheart. Franca, Red Boots Franca. Lumion's surprise was palpable. Red Boots Franca was a key figure in the Savoy mob, ruling over Rue des Blouses Blanches, and rumored to be a woman. Exactly, Louis affirmed. Franca appears to be the boss's mistress, but she seems to swing both ways. She and Little Minx are thick as thieves. A lover's lover. Lumion once again marveled at the peculiarities of Trier. Louis watched Jenna, now swaying gracefully on the stage, a look of longing etched on his face. She wasn't this mesmerizing when she first arrived in the market district. Over the past couple of years, she's become more adept at presentation, more feminine. What a shame. If you manage to climb the ranks and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with red boots, you might have a shot. Lumion teased, stoking Louis's ambition. He then shifted gears, any luck tracking down those three items I needed. Louis tore his gaze away from Jenna to respond. I was just about to tell you, we've managed to gather them all. That quick, Lumion was taken aback by the Savoy mob's efficiency. Why not start a factory? Why stick with the mob life? Louis elaborated, Rat Cristo keeps a variety of critters, some rare, some less so. Some we could take off his hands for the right price. That's how we got the lizard's eye and the snake's venom sack. The eagle's nest rock was a bonus. Rat Cristo, the one in charge of smuggling. Lumion mulled over this newfound information. 